Okay, guys, we're working with the notion of coloring in graph theory. Okay, so what the, in the ancient world it started much, much earlier than what we, where we are today. They were looking for ways to color maps. So there's, this might be a, a certain area in a particular place of the world. If you think about the United States, there's 52 states, I think, or 51, not sure. But if you want to color all of them a different color, what is the minimum number of colors that one can use to color a map? And that's the question here. Okay, so we can try and start looking for ways to do that, but we're looking for the fewest colors. Okay, and this is what we're going to do in graph theory now. Okay, so perhaps the most famous graph theory problem other than the bridges of Konigsberg is this coloring of maps. Okay, actual map makers usually use around seven colors, it says, to color a map. Well, coloring regions on a map corresponds to coloring the vertices of a graph. Since neighboring regions cannot be colored the same color, our graph cannot have vertices colored the same when those vertices are adjacent. So you can't have in the map above these two countries here having the same color. It doesn't distinguish then between the different countries. Okay, so our vertices on our graph cannot be adjacent. So in general, given a graph G, a coloring <coughs> sorry, of the vertices is called not surprisingly, vertex coloring. If the vertex coloring has the property that the adjacent vertices are colored differently, then the coloring is called proper. Okay, so we're going to be asking the smallest number of colors needed to get proper vertex coloring is called the chromatic number of the graph. And we write it with this chi, chi G. Okay, some people call that symbol Chi, it's actually pronounced Kai. Kai G represents the chromatics number, chromatic number. Now the chromatic number therefore deals with vertex coloring. Okay, now if we look at these graphs here, they ask us to find the chromatic number of the graphs below. Now I drew all of them here for us, or some of them in... Um, sketchpad, so we're going to be looking at that in a second. If I look at this graph here, this graph we call a complete graph. Good. It has six vertices. We call it K6. Now, folks, if you look at this graph, every vertex in this graph is adjacent to every other vertex. Okay? So that makes it quite difficult to color this graph. If you color this red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, then you'll have red, blue, red. There's two reds that are adjacent. Then you go blue, there's two blues that are adjacent. So for the connected graph, for the complete graph rather, all of these are connected graphs, for the complete graph K6, you'll need six colors. So the chromatic number for K6 is indeed 6. If we look at these triangles over here, I can see that I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 vertices. This vertex is adjacent to two others. This is adjacent to two others. This vertex is adjacent to two others. That one is, in fact, every single vertex in this diagram is adjacent to two other vertices. So if I look at the way I can color this, I can say blue, green, red. Now I must choose very carefully. Why did I do that? Let's first start with a triangle. Blue, green, red in the top triangle. None of those are adjacent vertices are um, the same color. Okay, I think let's go for a graph in Sketchpad that I can draw to prove this. I'm going to come to that graph just now. 
So let's draw that graph over here. We've got a triangle there. These are, are together. That one come that side comes out. I'm not really wanting to draw a perfect triangle, so I'm just drawing the situation that we have in the book. So there we have. It's like a bunch of stacked triangles. Oopsie. If I join those two together, I join these two vertices together, and I join those two together. So now it says, if I make this, let's just color it red, that vertex. Let's quickly make all these vertices. You can play around on Sketchpad quite nicely with your graph theory. I'm going to make the vertices large. Okay, so red, let's make this a color of green or yellow. And let's make this blue. So in the triangle there, we've got those three colors. Okay, so so far the chromatic number is three. I had to do that because no adjacent vertex must be the same, or must be the same color rather. Okay, so yellow, I'm going to take a chance and make this red again. So now, I cannot make this yellow, I cannot make this blue. So maybe the red was a bad choice here. Maybe I should have turned this into a blue. Let's just see why. If I now choose another color here, I can choose the color pink. Let's make it pink for now. Or yeah, let's just make it pink for now. And then here I can pretty much choose any other color. So I'm going to color this one yellow. Okay, so none of these vertices that are adjacent to one another have the same color. But now I'm asking, was this a good choice? If I had made this one red, so in other words, remember I had four colors there, then I could have chosen this one as blue. Then there are still, none of these are adjacent, that are adjacent to each other have the same coloring. And then this one, beautiful, this yellow vertex over here, also does not have any adjacent vertices with the same color. So for this situation, the chromatic number is indeed 3. Okay, so the chromatic number for this graph, in other words, the minimum number of colors that I can use to color adjacent vertices so that they do not have the same color, is indeed 3. Now notice that this graph here is not a complete graph. It's a connected graph. Okay? So there is no other way to color it, um, to color this graph over here. We needed three colors to do that. Now look at this last graph over here. Now folks, this we know. This is a bipartite graph. Now what does a bipartite graph do? A bipartite graph takes its vertices and it splits it up into two separate sets of vertices. Huh. So for any bipartite graph, the chromatic number has to be 2, because the vertices have been split already. Okay, so I hope that that one made good sense to you. Let's look at what they say here. Okay, so here is the bipartite graph K23 meaning the one set of vertices are 2, the other set of vertices are 3, and the chromatic number is 2. Earlier on we looked at a graph, a complete graph, with 6 vertices. Let's see if the same is true for a complete graph with 5 vertices. Well, I've drawn one here, and if you look at each one of these vertices, they are adjacent to every other vertex. Okay, so I cannot color another vertex red because this vertex is adjacent to all the other four. Okay, so yes, indeed in a complete graph, my vertices has to um, be, if it's a K5 graph, five colors. K10 graph, ten colors. Okay, let's look at a slightly more complex example. If I look at these, I have previously we dealt with that number of stacked triangles. If I stack another row of these triangles, again, the number 
of colours that I can use remains four, or three rather, in this case. Let's see why. Black, red, yellow. So I could have made this black and yellow, but then this will be adjacent. So I just change it to yellow and black over there. Then this can be red. So there's three colors here. I just distribute them differently. Where there's a black, I could have gone red, and then this would have been black. But that would mean that that would be adjacent. So I start with black, I go with red, then yellow, then black again. If we stack another row, let's just stack another row over here. Okay, I'm going to just quickly do that. I'll change those colors just now. Let's stack and join those two. We join these two. We join them. Join them. Oopsie, that one is a bit off the line. So we join those two and then we join them. Okay, let's just, all those colors are pink at the moment, so let's just leave them pink. Okay, now look at the sequence here. Red is followed by yellow. Okay, so if I start with yellow, it's followed by red there. So yellow, black, red. Black, red, yellow, black. Does it say something? No, it doesn't. Okay, so let's look at these vertices individually. If I choose to make this red, that one must be yellow. So it will work. I can't make this yellow and that red because of that adjacency. So if I turn this into a red, then this one will have to be a yellow. This is red, so I can turn this into a black. Okay, because the black yellow red that's yellow so this needs to be the next vertex I need to change into a red and then the very last vertex here will be a color that's yellow so every triangle in this diagram has that combination of colors if you look at the small triangle if you look at the bigger triangle then you see the same thing happening with that bigger triangle, this bigger triangle as well. But now we can't generalize that because then in the third level, we have three very same vertices, but it really doesn't matter because they're not adjacent. So the need is to focus on every single small triangle and to regroup those so that none of them are indeed adjacent to each other. So the chromatic number for this situation is still three. We only need three colors to cover our triangle uh, vertices and have no colors adjacent. So could there possibly be an answer for the map question that we had right here at the beginning we are asking? If the chromatic number of a graph can't be arbitrarily large, then it seems like there would be no upper, uh, there'd be no upper bound to the number of colors needed for any map, but indeed there is. The key observation is that while it is true that for any number n there is a graph with chromatic number n, only some graphs arrive as representations of maps. If you convert a map to a graph, the edges between the vertices correspond to the borders between the countries. So, you should be able to connect vertices in such a way where the edges do not cross. So, in other words, to look at the map, the map has to be a planar graph. Okay, and the answer is, best known, uh, the is the best known theorem in graph theory to the graph question. It says, it's called the four-color theorem. If G is a planar graph, then the chromatic number of G is less than or equal to 4. Now that's interesting. If G is a planar graph, then the chromatic number of G is less than or equal to 4. Thus any map can be properly colored with 4 or fewer colors. Now that's very interesting. Now you can read here 
the the proof is incredibly difficult and long and cumbersome so we're not even going to look at that proof okay let's just look at one more example which I had prepared for us here we looked at these graphs and we looked at coloring them okay where am I now here we go let's let's leave that one for now let's leave that one for now we are talking about coloring now in general in the math department we plan to offer 10 classes next semester some classes cannot run at the same time perhaps they are taught by the same lecturer or are required for seniors okay so here is the information that they gave us they say class A conflicts with class D and I B conflicts with D, I and J so this is the class there's five 11 classes let me just count A, B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 10 classes and here's all the conflicting classes that these classes by themselves clash with so after, the question is how many different time slots are needed and which should be taught at the same time more importantly how could we use graph coloring to answer this question now we're going to come back to that just now if we look at this graph over here what I've done is I've said A conflicts with D and I so I was asking myself the question this is just me I'm not saying this is how we do it this is how I thought about the question I looked at every other class that clashes with DI okay so there's a clash with DI there's a clash with DI there's a clash with DI so so far A, B and F can be put together but then I thought okay isn't there a bigger set so I looked at clashes with I and C clashed with I E clashed with I and H clashed with I now I could not put E or, or A, B, C and F in the same group because F clashes with C okay so what I did is I said let me put A, B, C and H together let's see why A, B, C and H all clash with I without there being clashes with one another so I've put them in one group a B C and H so A is covered B is covered C is covered and H was covered then I looked at those that had other clashes that were the same so A B and F here there's an A B and an F here so D and I could go together but J could also join them because that doesn't clash with anything else okay or G rather so I put A G and then what did I put together I put D sorry I put D G and I together in one group now I suppose I could have put more in that group but then I the rest I put in the same group J E F and let's see why J clashes with B G H E clashes with CHI okay so there's a clash here so similar clash between E and J okay and F had not been assigned to another to a group F wasn't assigned to the first group because it clashed with C so I put J E and F so by what I thought limit just looking at this I could create three time slots and these can run in the same time slot now there could have been other constraints so let's see what they talk about they talk about cartography is certainly not the only application of graph coloring there are plenty other situations now here he talks about if you have <coughs> excuse me for example you might wish to store chemicals safely store them safely to avoid explosions each pair of chemicals should not be stored in the same room so we have certain chemicals that can be stored in the same room others that can't be
By colouring a graph with vertices representing chem chemicals and edges representing potential negative interactions, you can determine the smallest number of rooms needed to store those chemicals. Okay, let's look at an example. This is a beautiful example. Radio stations broadcast their signal at certain frequencies. Now we know that. However, there are a limited number of frequencies that you can choose from if you are in a particular district. So nationwide, many stations can use the same frequency because they don't lie close enough to one another to interfere um, with each other, with one another's uh, broadcast. Okay, so we have 10 radio stations. Now here they have it represented by a 10 by 10 matrix. We call this matrix an adjacency matrix. Okay, so here the matrix is set up in a certain unpopular, sorry, 10 radio stations are set up. The radio stations that are close enough to each other to cause interference are recorded in this 10 by 10 matrix. Okay, the question is, what is the fewest number of frequencies the station can use? Okay, now we're going to use that by coloring edges. Okay, we represent the, uh, the graph, the problem as a graph with vertices as the stations and edges when two stations are close enough to cause interference. So the edges on our graph will represent if, the, uh, if there's an edge that, that connects two vertices, means those two are going to interfere with one another's um, frequency. Okay, here we go. Uh, what we've got here is the adjacency matrix. Now folks, let's just quickly talk about the adjacency matrix itself. You will see that if a side, uh, I've, I've used the vertices here, everything, every three letters in each of these names are K, Q, E. So I ignored that and I just used the last letter. So for instance, if A is connected to C, then here C will also be connected to A. If A is connected to F, F will be connected to A. If A is connected to G, G will be connected to A as well. So there's symmetry in this matrix. So when we read the matrix, I'm going to put a line across there, and I'll talk about that now. Why that line? If we look carefully, on this diagonal in this matrix, there's no entries, and that's for a reason. And it is because A connects with A, it doesn't make sense. There won't be interference. C won't interfere with C. E won't interfere with E. So the entries at the top half of this diagonal is identical to the entries at the bottom half. So to populate our diagram here with, I think there's 10 edges, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, it's a 10 by 10 matrix, hello, I said so earlier. We then just have to look at either the top or the bottom of this matrix. So let's start. A is connected to C. So let's first connect A with C. Okay, and immediately I'm going to choose to make these uh, lines a little bit medium. There we go. Okay, so A to C represents the fact that A and C are too close to each other and cannot function in the same frequency. Okay, so A connects to F. A, collect that. A connects to F. I see it keeps it on as a thinner line, so let's just stay with the line that's thin. Okay, then A also connects G. So I go to A and I connect it to G, and A connects with J. So A is too close to four other stations to broadcast on the same frequency. B connects to C. Go to B, connect it, collect my tool there. B connects with C. B also connects with D. 
So B is too close to C and is that the only two? Yeah. B is too close to C and D to be on the same frequency. We go to C. C connects to E. No, sorry, there's C. Connects to F, G and J. So C connects to F. C connects to G. And C also connects connected to J. Okay, so the vertices there is 4. Let's just check the degree is 4 here as well. Okay, we go to D, vertex D down here. We need to also connect it to E, F and H. So D connects to D, connects to E, to F and to H. Now you can check here again. If you look at the number of entries in D, there's four entries, so the degree of the vertex D must be four. There's two entries in E, so the degree of E must be two. That's a way to check whether you made a mistake or not. So let's move on to E. E just have to connect to I still. So E connects to I over there. There we go. F connects to G and J. F connects to G. And F still has to connect to J. Now we finished with F, so let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is the degree. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we've got the right drawing. G just has to connect to J still. So G connects to J. H connects to I. That's the only connection that I still need to do there. Let's just check. H has two edges, so the degree definitely two, we correct. I still needs to connect with J. I has a valence of three, one, two, three. Let's just do a spot check. J, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So it looks like, <coughs> sorry, we've got our graph here. Why did that one color red? Let's just change the color uh, to blue as well. There we go. Now we need to start coloring our edges. Now remember the edges that are joined with a uh, the vertices is what we're going to color. The vertex that is joined with uh, an edge, those two vertices cannot have the same color. Why not? because the edge represents the fact that the two stations are too close to one another and cannot broadcast on the same frequency. Okay, so we're looking at non-adjacency for coloring here. Now let's start. Let's just start with A. A is adjacent to J, G, F and C. Okay, so if I color this vertex, I give it a red color, then these may not have a red color. So everything that's not adjacent to A, I can color with red. That is not adjacent. This one is not adjacent, but it's adjacent to I. F is adjacent. E is adjacent to I as well, so it can't be colored red. But Look at this, D is not adjacent, so I can color D in a red color as well. Okay, let's just make 100% sure. Yes, so D can be colored in red. Okay, now let's see if there's any others that can be colored. J couldn't be I, I didn't color I, sorry, I had to be colored red as well. Can I color B? No, because B is adjacent to D. I cannot color C red because it's adjacent to A. So it looks like there's only those three stations that can broadcast on a particular frequency because they're far enough from one another as so not to interfere in their different broadcasts. So they won't broadcast on the same frequency. Okay. Let us go, let's just for the fun of it, choose the number J. Which one has the highest number of vertices? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, let's go to F. Let's give F a color of yellow. Now, F 
is not adjacent to E. So I can immediately make E yellow as well. Okay, so F is adjacent to D, it's adjacent to C, to A, to J, not adjacent to I, but I is colored already, and it's not adjacent to H. H is not adjacent to E, so there we go. H can get a color that's yellow as well. And it looks like that takes care of the yellow color. Now, we still haven't one, two, three, four vertices left. Okay, so let us go for B in this case. B is adjacent to red, so I cannot make it red. So I'm going to turn B into green. B is not adjacent to G. So I can turn G into a green as well. <clears throat> B is not adjacent to J, but G and J are adjacent to one another. B is adjacent to C, so I can't do anything with that color there. Okay, so let's go to J. Yeah, or let's go to C. C is, well, they both have, have a valence of 5 or a vertex degree of 5. Okay, so I can't go red, I can't go green, I can't go yellow. There's a problem. So I need a new color. So I'm going to make that color pink. So J is pink. Pink cannot connect with that one because that already is adjacent. Okay, so the only one that I can now deal with is C. Now let's look at C. C is adjacent to green, to red, C is adjacent to yellow, and it's adjacent to pink. So it must have its own color. Okay, it can't have any of the colors that are already on the graph. So what did we see? We see the chromatic number for this graph is indeed 5 because there's five colors represented on this graph. So that makes perfect sense. Okay, now remember, why then not four? Why is the chromatic number for this graph not four? Because it's not a planar graph. Okay, for a chromatic number to be four, the graph has to have edges that do not cross with one another says now. In the example above, the chromatic number was 5, but this is not a counterexample for the four-color theorem, since the graph represented by the radio stations was not planar. Okay, now remember what the four-color theorem said. It said you can graph any, um, any map could be colored in using four and four colors only. So it would be nice to have some quick way of finding a chromatic number possibly for non-planar graphs as well. Okay, while we might not be able to find the exact chromatic number of a graph easily, we can often give a reasonable range for the chromatic number. In other words, we can give an upper and lower bounds for the chromatic number. Now let's see what they say about that. The chromatic number, by the way, is represented by chi g. Remember that. And vg here I'm talking about the number of vertices of the graph. Okay, they introduce another symbol later on when they talk about the maximum number of vertices. They use delta, but we'll change it later. Okay, so for every graph, the chromatic number is at least one, and at most the number of vertices of the graph. Well, it says here, do you want a better bound? Well, there is a better bound. And this brings in new language, a clique. A clique is a graph. In a graph is a set of vertices of which are pairwise adjacent. All of which are pairwise adjacent. Pairwise adjacent. That forms a clique. So a clique of sign, size n is just a copy of the complete graph n. We define the clique number of a graph to be the largest number n for which the graph has a clique of size n. Okay, so the largest number n for which a graph, any graph, 
has a clique of size n. That is the clique number of the graph. Any clique of size n cannot be colored with fewer than n colors. We have, uh, we have a nice lower bound here by the next theorem. So the chromatic number of a graph is at least the clique number of that graph. Okay, now the, they represent the clique with a different symbol. A clique is represented with an omega symbol, but we'll get to that now. Okay, there are times when the chromatic number G is equal to the clique number. Those graphs are called perfect graphs. If you know that a graph is perfect, then finding the chromatic number is simply a matter of searching for the largest clique. Okay, the, the, this work here we're going to look at in summary when we finish our chapter. So I'll come back to this. For an upper bound now, they say let delta G be the largest degree of any vertex in a graph. Now here, delta G represents the largest degree of any vertex. So if there's a vertex with degree 4 and there's a vertex with degree 7, then delta G is 7. Okay, one reasonable guess for an upper bound on the chromatic number is that the chromatic number is not more than the maximum, the largest number, the, <laughs> the degree of the, the largest degree of a vertex in the graph, plus 1. So if the largest degree is 7, we add 1 and that's 8. Your chromatic number will be 8 or will be less than 8. Now they ask you why is this reasonable. They say starting with any vertex to get it together with all its neighbors can be colored in delta G plus 1 colors. Now let's just talk about that. When you start at a vertex, the vertex is removed. Then the other vertices come into the argument. Since at most we are talking about delta G plus 1 vertices in this set, Okay, delta G plus 1 vertices. Now fan out. At any point, if you consider an already colored vertex, some of its neighbors might be colored, some might be not. But no matter what, the vertex and its neighbors could all be colored distinctly. That means with a different color. Since they are at most delta G neighbors. Plus the one vertex that has already been considered hence the delta G plus 1. In fact, there are examples of graphs for which the chromatic number is exactly the, the maximum number, the vertex number, <laughs> the, ve the delta G, you know what it means, plus 1. For any n, the complete graph Kn has a chromatic number n, but Delta Kn, so the, ma the, 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 the maximum number, the vertex with a maximum number of edges coming into it, will be n minus 1, since every vertex is adjacent to every other vertex. So the maximum number of vertices in a complete graph with n, the vertex with a maximum number, n minus 1. Additionally, any odd cycle will have a chromatic number of 3, but the degree of every vertex in the cycle will be 2 because an edge is connected with two vertices. Well, in comes Brooks' theorem, which will help quite nicely. Brooks' theorem says any graph G which satisfies chi G less than equal to delta G will, satis will satisfy that. Unless G is a complete graph, okay? or an odd cycle, in which case the chromatic number of the graph will be delta G plus 1. Okay, so that is very important, folks. Let us have a look at how we can summarize what we've just read. Okay, so we're talking about the bounds on a chromatic number. Assign distinct colors to distinct vertices always yields a proper coloring. Okay? So the chromatic number is lies always between the number of vertices in the graph and 1. The only graphs that can be one colored 
are the graphs that are edgeless. Now think about this. You have a vertex here, you have a vertex there. There's no edge connecting them. So you can both vertices can be read. A complete graph Kn of, vertice, of n vertices requires a chromatic number of n colors. Okay, so that's for a complete graph. Why is that the case? Because we said all the vertices are adjacent to one another. An optimal coloring, in an optimal coloring, there must be at least one of the graphs M edges between every pair of coloring color classes. So, chromatic number multiplied by the chromatic number minus one is always less or equal to twice the number of edges. Interesting. And it's again the idea of you've got uh, vertices connecting to edges. So we're going to look at edge coloring now and then we'll come back to our summary. What is edge coloring all about? Let me just see if I'm missing something that I wanted to do with you on um, Sketchpad. Now that's still coming. So that's our last graph we're going to look at on Sketchpad. So coloring edges, folks, deals with the chromatic index. We call that the chromatic index of a graph. Just like the vertex coloring, we must insist that edges that are adjacent must be colored differently. Okay? When you're working out the chromatic index. Okay? Here we are talking of two edges as being adjacent to each other if they are incident in the same vertex, then they're adjacent. Okay? So those two edges must have a different color. The least number of colors required to properly color the edges of a graph G is called its chromatic index. And this is the notation we use. We use chi prime for, uh, uh, to, to represent the chromatic index. So chi of G, chi of G represents the chromatic number, chi prime G represents the chromatic index. Okay, and we will look at this by looking at an example where this here where, where we work out the chromatic edges okay so we want to talk about two uh, three friends six friends that want to play chess in the afternoon all these friends want to play one another but they don't want to play two games at the same time so everyone will play everyone else at least once they have plenty of chess sets but nobody wants to play the same or two games at the same time. Games will last an hour, thanks to these handy chess clocks. How many hours will the tournament last? Okay, now folks, I can think, you can see the relevance to this as looking for the chromatic index. Because two people are going to play the same game. So two vertices connected with one another represents a game. Now let's see how we do this on Sketchpad. Okay, I'm going to again make the vertices a little bit bigger so that they stand out. So the vertices are large. and But now I'm looking at edges. Okay, and no adjacent edge must have the same color. So let's say these two are going to play one another. So let's make that color red. Okay, I think we can make it a little bit thicker. In fact, let's make all the colors here thicker. I click on one of the sides and I say I want medium for all of them. So those two are going to play one another. These two are going to play one another. Okay. So that we're going to give a different color. Let's make it yellow. And then uh, I've already used those two, so I can make these two a third color. That color I am going to make green. Okay, so now that is what we've got so far. 
Now that is in the first hour. Those are going to play one another. Okay, so in the first hour, in fact, you know what? Let's make all of them red. It's going to be better to use the same color in the first hour. Okay, none of the adjacent of them are adjacent edges. So in the second hour, these two can play one another. Those two can play uh, against one another, and these two can play against one another. Okay, but those are adjacent sides. So these two are the third combination that I'm going to use and let's make it green. Okay, so now those have played against one another in the second hour. Now let's just go around on the edges for now. Let's deal with the edges first. They are going to play, those two are going to play and those two are going to play in the next hour. So make that color a bright blue. In the game after that, this lot are going to play against one another. Oopsie, I missed there. So if we color them, we'll have, let's make them pink. Now that leaves us with the final match, which will take place with those three. So I'm just going to leave them blue. So let's see what we've got. We've got red, we've got blue light, okay, we have got uh, green as a color, and we have blue dark as a color. Do we have all our, oh, and we forgot about the pink. We forgot to include the pink. Okay, so that means my number of edges that I have is one, two, three, four, five. So this here, this graph is K6. And its chromatic index is 5 over here. Because it has 5 different colors for the edges. Okay, so let's see what they did over here. They represented, and they said it is represented by a K6 graph, meaning a complete graph with six vertices. And they found the chromatic number to be five. Okay, so we can see our chromatic number definitely is equal to five, since there is a vertex of degree five. One, two, three, four, five. Each vertex in this case for the complete, oopsie, for the complete graph has uh, five edges coming into it. Okay, it turns out that, now let's see, if one of the, the friends leaves the early, the chromatic number will still not change. It will just remove him or her or the person from the graph that we have, the complete graph. So we must color each of the edges. Each color must represent a different hour in this case, which it did. Since different edges incident in the same vertex will be colored then differently. No player will be playing two different games at the same time. Okay, so if a friend leaves then again, the, the, the graph changes to K5, but it still needs five hours to complete. So in general, what can we say about the chromatic index? Certainly, the chromatic index of a graph is bigger than or equal to the maximum number of vertices it goes or edges it goes into a vertice, vertex. So the maximum degree of one of the vertices in the graph. But how much bigger can it be? Only a little higher. It says here, Wiesing's theorem. For any, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. For any graph G, the chromatic index chi prime G is either delta G or delta G plus one. So for uh, this K6 graph, it was bigger than five, bigger or equal to five, but can be less than equal to six, big, uh, with Wiesing's theorem. 
Okay, graphs where the chromatic index is equal to delta G are called class 1 graphs. Bipartite graphs, the chromatic index is always equal to the maximum degree of the vertices of G. So the chromatic index is always equal to delta G. Now folks, you can read through the rest of this. It's very interesting if you look at this that in 1964, uh, Wiesing's theorem was proved. In 1965, Wiesing proved that all planar graphs will, with delta G bigger than equal to, uh, to 8, are of class 1. And look at this. In 2001, there were still proofs coming in about graph theory. So it's a brand new set of mathematics that you're learning about. Okay, so Ramsey's theorem. Ramsey's theorem deals with the coloring of edges. Now, we almost over, almost finished with the chapter, so we'll just read about what Ramsey is saying. Okay, there's another interesting way that we might consider coloring edges, quite different from what we have discussed thus far. What if we colored every edge of a graph, either red or blue? Can we do this without, say, creating a monochromatic triangle? In other words, an all red or all blue triangle? Certainly for some graphs, the answer is yes. Try doing this for K4, K5 or K6. How far can we go? It says the problem in, uh, above is not too difficult and is a fun exercise. We could extend the question in a variety of ways. What if we had three colors? What can we do with that? Surprisingly, very little is known about these questions. For example, we know that you need to, to go up to K17, the complete graph with 17 vertices, in order to force a monochromatic triangle that uses three colors. Okay. Similarly, we know that using two colors, K18, is the simplest, smallest graph that forces a monochromatic copy of K4. Okay, so all of this has to do with Ramsey's theorem. Let's just, to finish off, look at the summary that I've got for us here. Okay, so in an optimal coloring, there must be at least one of the graph's M edges between every pair of color classes so the chromatic number G multiplied by the chromatic number G minus 1 will have to, is less or equal to twice um, M, the number of edges in the graph. Okay, if G contains a clique of size K, then at least K colors are needed to color that clique. In other words, the chromatic number is at least the clique number. Now the clique number is represented by omega g. So the chromatic in a clique, the chromatic number of the graph is big or equal to the clique number of the graph. So for perfect graphs, these two things are equal. Okay? This bound is tight. Find cliques, finding cliques is known as the clique problem. Okay, we move on. The two colorable graphs are exactly the bipartite graphs. We've seen that. By the four-color theorem, every planar graph can be colored using four colors. There were graphs that we looked at that had more colors, but they were not planar. Okay, a greedy coloring shows that every graph can be colored with one more color than the maximum vertex degree. Okay, this delta G is the maximum vertex degree. So, the chromatic number is always less than equal to delta G, the maximum vertex degree, plus 1. For complete graphs, the chromatic number is N. And the maximum vertex degree is N minus 1. Okay, in a cycle, and we talk about cycles as CN, odd cycles, vertices with or cycles with an odd number of vertices, we have a chromatic number of 3. So you can only color that graph 
with three different colors. Okay, you can color it with three different colors. And then delta G is two. It's an odd cycle. Now, folks, that's almost common sense. Because if it's a cycle, none of the edges or none of the vertices are repeated. So each vertex has two um, edges that goes into it. And even cycles, cycles with an even number of vertices, have a chromatic number of two and a maximum vertex degree of two. Now, here's an example of an even cycle. It's an even cycle of length 6. That's why it's even. Okay, the number of vertices here is n. The number of edges is n. The chromatic number is 2. Because all we're going to do is we're going to alternate as we go through the vertices. And the chromatic index is also 2. Because adjacent sides cannot have the same color. Okay, so for these graphs, the bound is best possible. In all other cases, the bound can be slightly improved, and that's where Brooks's theorem came in. Brooks's theorem said the chromatic graph is always less than or equal to delta G, which is the maximum vertex degree for a connected simple graph G, unless G is a complete graph or an odd cycle. Okay, those are the two restrictions on Brooks's theorem. Now folks, this chapter has a lot of detail in it, but the detail is more or less summarized on this page. You can now look at the problems that follow at the end. Just look at the problems that have the blue highlight on the problems, because for those you have the answers directly in your textbook so you can find the answers there. Okay, please like the video and remember folks to subscribe to my channel.